I'm curious, how, how do you view the revision of those trade deals? Is this the fool's game? Is it a way to put better, more protectionism, because you say it's taking away free trade? I mean, all those negotiations, Japan, Korea, uh, Alina, I mean, uh, Mexico, Canada, uh, how do you view them? Totally inefficient? They're supposed to bring norms you know, at a certain level. I mean, they're supposed to bring some good at some, some areas, or you, you, you don't find them useful at all. So the case of uh, Korea US FTA revision, Marcus already told uh, nothing much, but uh, one thing we could have gained a lot uh -huh. from that uh, chorus FTA, because uh, original you know, agreement says uh, within, uh, I mean, from 2021, 25% tariff on pickup truck will be gone. Mm -hmm. But through this uh, renegotiations, this 2021 is extended to 2041. So, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. we don't produce and export anything, any pickup truck yet to, to U.S., but we lost a lot of potential sure, because uh, of that. benefits uh, yeah. out of this kind of re renegotiation. So, so we are moving away from more sure. free trade. Yeah. Marcus and then Carl. So the NAFTA agreement was 25 years old, mm -hmm. and there was all kinds of things like digital commerce that really didn't even exist when it was negotiated. So you could make the argument that it was sort of like an old house that needed some refurbishing. And if you had had um, the kind of government that had existed in the United States for the previous three generations, what would have come out of that process would have been far from perfect, but it would have been a kind of rational attempt to bring the rules more into alignment with the actual way commerce was operating. Um, and you could, and, uh, but what happened was that effort, a lot of it was focused on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm because it was simply a bigger deal. Canada and Mexico were already members, so when we got TPP, we would basically be sort of cleaning the, now I'm really mixing metaphors, mm -hmm. but we would sort of be cleaning the whole house. When Trump pulled us out of TPP, that caused the trade diversion problems I alluded to earlier with respect to, say, pork in the Japanese market, but it also meant that we had to now do those things within the context of NAFTA. and. Um, a government that wanted to fix up those things probably could have done a better job, but this government is fundamentally protectionist. Mm -hmm. So it used that opportunity to do things like alter rules of origin mm -hmm. that had the effect of making that agreement, pulling the agreement away from free trade rather than moving it ever closer. Carl? No, I only wanted to add that I think that the EU in its efforts to um, conclude bilateral trade agreements generally wants to open markets. I think so, and there are new um, issues uh, beyond tariffs. I mean, all the what is happening in the trades in the services sector. This is all liberalizing. But you know that uh, there's a lot of opposition to trade deals in Europe today, and mm -hmm. in France especially. I mean, population doesn't understand them, and it's it's a hard thing to to explain nowadays why it would be good eventually a uh, level playing field. Uh, uh, it's just uh, it's not working. People are not buying it anymore. I think in Europe it has a different issue than in other places. In Europe it's about um, the fear to lose influence on standards and the fear that uh, there is no uh, democratic legitimacy mm -hmm. in, in the changes. And, and, of course and the secrecy concerns. of it too, yeah. yeah. And of course distributional concerns. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think uh, what, uh, uh, what we have seen over, over the last um, 30 years or so during, certainly during the period of, of, of hyper-globalization is an increase in inequality. Um, sometimes very clearly measured in the United States, sometimes not that obvious, like in, the United, uh, like in Germany, where since 2005 numbers are not actually moving anymore, but perceived inequality has mm -hmm. gone up quite a lot. And the, if you look at the re research that exists on populism, you know, there seems to be a link. And uh, many believe that uh, you know, trade openness exacerbates Opening up trade exacerbates that mm -hmm. problem. It creates it creates losers, and um, uh, you know, there's a, 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 a very strong opposition uh, politically to to allow these these these, uh, these losses to occur uh, in periods of uh, political fragility. Uh, and I think that is m maybe in Europe the most important argument right now. That mm -hmm. the, many would, would believe that the, for example, Mercosur agreement is actually a good thing. It would actually help us rein in Bolsonaro in his uh, in, you know uh, make him. Uh, ab abide by the Paris Agreement, for example, but uh, the 
you know, fragility, the political fragility within Europe makes it difficult to create losers that would uh, then, you know, support populist parties and, and, mm. and, and wreck, wreck havoc uh, in, in, in ways that we don't want. Just add one more thing. Sure. I mean, your argument, like a free trade is not welcome by you know, France or EU. I think uh, this is a traditional uh, issue. Uh, I taught international trade for many, many years. Yes. But uh, when I come to the part of political economy trade policy, you know, gains from trade is spread all over the people, whole population, mm -hmm. whole industry. Mm -hmm. But uh, loss of the you know, difficulties out of the market opening is concentrating on certain sectors. Uh, they can unite themselves and make a demonstration. They can do lots of other things. So politicians looking at these two sides, who, you know, politicians will take which part? protectionist you know, uh, uh, policy stance is much better for their election. Mm. So now you mention about losers, you know, I think you know, politicians comes in, then populists yeah. uh, win the, win the you know, election. We, we were talk just before going back to you, Marcus, I'd like to welcome you, Mr. Watanabe. Thank well, you for thank you being here. And we were talking about free trade agreements, and I know you have a great experience on the Japanese-US uh, trade agreement, and it would be nice for you to share with us sure. what you think. We were talking about convergence of economies. It's not exactly your point of view, I think. If you might tell us uh, how, what you felt about the renegotiation between US and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, may I yes, uh, yes, make please. intervention now? Well, uh, sorry to be late. Uh, <laughs> I thought that uh, this session will start at 4 p.m. Oh, that's, so, that was uh, wrong, that was yeah, wrong. Yeah, from 4 to 5.30, so I and <laughs> By the way, it's not a whole presentation because we're just going back and forth, you know, just, just sure. answer through this question and you'll and no be problem. able to answer to others afterwards. No problem. Okay, uh, there's a positive side and negative side of this uh, most recent Japan-US uh, trade agreement. Uh, first of all, uh, from Japanese perspective, uh, it was quite, uh, uh, good agreement uh, because uh, we could uh, avoid the uh, imposition of 25% uh, uh, you know, duties on Japanese cars to be imported uh, to United States from Japan. So that's one thing. And the negative side is that uh, uh, this will reduce the chances, opportunities for United States to come back to the TPP. So uh, that's the that's uh, kind of thing? negative side. Do you think it's a good thing? Bad thing. Oh, a bad thing. You a mean all together, yeah. that's, that's fine. But mm. uh, kind of negative side is that uh, uh, since, uh, you know, the United States uh, has been looking for Japanese agriculture market, now uh, United States got some uh, access, that's, you know, improved yeah. access of mm -hmm. uh, uh, U.S. agriculture products to the Japanese market. Right. So that will reduce uh, opportunities uh, for United States to come back to TPP, uh, original TPP, that is TPP-12. So Marcus Nolan, who's sitting next to you, was disagreeing on the tariffs. Maybe he can explain why. Yeah, um, so I do not believe that this agreement spares Japan from the uh, Section 232 case on automobiles and the potential tariff. I mean, Prime Minister Abe wanted that commitment, but he hasn't gotten it. Um, th what the two sides have said is that there is a phase one of the negotiation, which has, uh, been, uh, which has been announced, which is a limited number of tariff cuts, or tariff cuts on a limited number of sectors. Um, but, the, but the key point is it actually doesn't do that. It doesn't spare the Japanese automobile industry. Now, there's going to be a phase two of the negotiation, and perhaps at that point, Japan can extract that commitment but uh, it hasn't thus far. Um, and the other thing I would just make a, a minor point, you know, in the previous discussion, we were, we were discussing the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement as though it existed. It's been negotiated, it but the legislation hasn't been passed in the United States. That's true. And the issue we face now is that the House of Representatives is controlled by the Democratic Party, the Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, if you just went and polled the congressman uh, you smack a, or whatever you want to call it could probably pass the House of Representatives. But Pelosi wants to keep in kind of in step with whoever the eventual Democratic presidential nominee is going to be. If it looks like that's going to be Joe Biden or somebody like Beto O'Rourke who have pretty moderate views on trade, the legislation can move forward. But if it looks like it's going to be Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, she's going to hold back on that legislation. So even in the case of, of this agreement, um, uh, we've negotiated agreement, but the United States hasn't actually uh, passed the implementing legislation. Mm. 
Gabriel, you and then there is an something? additional uh, collateral damage that might come from the EU-US agreement, and that is the WTO, once again, because of uh, its Article 24 that actually says that uh, free trade agreements should cover substantially all trade. So if you just pick uh, what is easy for you and leave the rest, then uh, uh, that uh, might be violating uh, Article 24. And No, who cares? The US administration certainly not, but we thought the Japanese would actually care. And, uh, and in that sense, um, you know, that, that's, that's a negative uh, on that agreement, at least in my, in my view. It doesn't cover substantially all trade, and it doesn't take the tariffs to zero, either one. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, uh, you know, uh, I worked as an uh, economic affairs officer at the WTO Secretariat some time ago, dealing with Article 24. And actually, you know, after the Euro round negotiations, uh, you have a more precise term in, you know, in terms of, say, for instance, those FTA or customs union agreements should be concluded within a reasonable period of time. And that has been defined as uh, 10 years. So you see, uh, maybe this agreement will come into force, but in 10 years' time, that's considered to be reasonable length of time. So if uh, both Japan and the United States can agree uh, to uh, reach a higher level of coverage of this agreement, that would be fine with WTO.